step away from the book of Revelation today and um, a basic, simple message. But don't be mistaken, perhaps in its simplicity, the message will speak to you. And by the way, the gospel should be simple and easy to understand. I pray it will speak to the hearts. The Holy Spirit will enable those who have a heavy spirit about them, uh, depressed or beaten down, to take comfort and be encouraged. And those of you who have walked long enough in this Christian walk to glean some encouragement as well. So I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture, and then I'll set the stage for what we're going to do. If you wish to follow along, I am in Luke's Gospel in the 23rd chapter. And while you are turning there to the 23rd chapter, beginning perhaps at verse 32, I would simply say this message is a message of salvation and grace for the chiefest of sinners or salvation available to every dying thief. No matter how you title this message, there'll be one theme to keep in mind. And I'll say that after I read from verse 32 forward, Luke 23, beginning at verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to a place which is called Calvary, they, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And they parted and they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, saying to him, If thou be king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors begins my focus here. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou, art, when thou comest into thy kingdom. In verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Those few verses give you a very clear idea of something which is often forgotten. We tend to rally around the gospel records recording the great miracles and the great deeds and all of the disciples. But if you think about it, Christ's last earthly companion and his last earthly, we're talking about before his resurrection, his last earthly convert was this dying thief on the cross. And I also think it's remarkable, if you think about it in a bigger picture, his last earthly companion is this thief on the cross. And if you take his words literally, today you'll be with me in paradise, his first heavenly companion is indeed this man. It's kind of a remarkable idea if you think about it, very simple. My goal is not to complicate. I do that really good most of the time. But um, what I want to be understood here, although I say the gospel is simple, the condescension of Christ, God sending his only begotten son, I think is a still a great mystery, although it's a mystery unfolded for us in the Bible, it's still a great mystery and cannot really be taken hold of in its fullest. Like this time of year where people walk around talking about the birth of Christ, and I've said this before, not born in December, not understanding what even if we were talking about the birth of Christ at a different time in the year, what that would mean in terms of the impact on the world. Little, I'm sorry friends, little or nothing if Christ did not come to die and was not raised from the dead. Every child that was born in Israel, every mother anticipated their child 
was the Messiah. So the birth of a child, although spectacular and in Christ's case miraculous, still not enough to do, still not enough to convince, still not enough to reveal the power of God as it was foretold in the Old Testament. When you think about it that way, it's pretty staggering, this record. And it, whether you want to go to secular history or you want to read the Bible and take it as recorded history of the unfolding drama of God's redemption for humankind, there was never a day such as recorded as the day that this passage refers to. It was Passover time. The passage I'm referring to out of Luke 23, it was Passover time. And where people would flock to certain places, just like in the Old Testament when God first instituted the Passover. These are concepts, by the way, that they're so basic to most of you, but there's a whole universe out there that say, well, why study the Old Testament then? Why even look at it? Why? Because right there in the Old Testament, God was writing the gospel message. He had not yet revealed his son, tented in human flesh, but he was writing the gospel message for the children of Israel in Egypt's bondage. And after the Lord was at Moses' hand and rod, displaying his power and placing the plagues upon Egypt, one of those last was the death of the firstborn. And the children of Israel are told to kill an animal and to take that blood, to apply it to their doorposts, go inside and shut the door. They were told other things too, but in this particular instance, this becomes the institution of the Passover that will later be instituted. The date will be changed and fixed, but this is the first Passover. And all those who applied the blood, as long as they applied the blood and did as the Lord prescribed by the mouth of Moses and Aaron, they would be saved, they would be spared. Now, I don't know, listen, uh, Cecil B. DeMille in his depiction of the Ten Commandments, uh, he's got, there's a funny scene if you watch it, there's a lot of funny things in old movies, you pay attention to the fact that they didn't have the type of character generator and special effects, so there's one particular passage, it might be in that movie or there might be in one other version of it, uh, depicting the Exodus, where there's some guy running down the street, and of course the death angel's coming, and the guy just collapses in the street. Really terrible, you know, bad acting, you know, when somebody drops to the ground, and they're, they're, it takes them like 10 minutes to die. Uh, <laughs> but it was one of those, and I thought somebody at least captured the essence, not the 10 minutes of dying, but captured the essence of what it was to be outside of the house and outside of the instructions and outside obeying God's command to apply the blood. And, there was no respecting, there was no distinguishing between someone who might have been a higher upper in the slave ranking, someone who might have been a higher upper, maybe someone who was related to Aaron, or maybe someone who was a stranger. There was no respecting, as long as all of these individuals, rich or poor, mind you, all slaves, as long as they did apply the blood, the death angel passed over. And later on, we read both in Exodus and later on Leviticus and Numbers where God says, and this will be celebrated from generation to generation to commemorate this act. And if you think about it, it's a very simple act. And we're now, I'm fast forwarding to, into the New Testament time. It is still a memorial. There hasn't been, as Paul will describe in the New Testament just yet, Christ our Passover. We have the unfolding of Christ becoming our Passover here in these chapters, just before he dies on the cross. So if you think about it, remembering the Passover for the Jews would be a reminder of God's fidelity, his faithfulness to his word, the deliverance of the people. And for anybody looking underneath that to find the gospel message, you'll see once more what they took was an innocent animal in the shedding of blood that would cover and would be a type standing in for the one that the writer of Hebrews says, no longer the blood of bulls and goats, but one sacrifice, the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ on that altar, looking to that altar as he laid down his life. People talk about this in a funny way. I was reading a website this morning, somebody saying, well, he really didn't die. What happened to him? 
is he had, what did I tell you? He got massages and therapy. <laughs> Isn't that what I said? That's, that's the darndest thing I've ever heard. Well, I, I, I want to find his therapist then. <laughs> so if you can fix that, you can fix anything. I mean, he had a little bit more issues going on than just uh, sore muscles. But what's so interesting about this is we have in this particular period, in this particular passage, something that's happening which will, as I said, never an event recorded like this. You think about it, in the day that Christ was crucified, in that time, um, there are all kinds of things that are recorded that seem strange to us, how the sky was dark and how the earth shook, how people came out of graves when it says that he gave up his spirit, that people came out of graves. There was never a day like that ever in history recorded. Now, there'll be people that will say, well, this is uh, the uh, handiwork of delusional disciples following and wanting to fill in the blanks to make it all come together nicely. But I've said this many times, if you're going to make up a story, this is a terrible one to make up. It doesn't even make sense to me when you think about it, except if you begin to read this whole book and you realize that the whole book, the Old Testament, will basically be made abundantly clear in the New Testament with the coming of Christ, his death and resurrection, meaning everything and bringing to life and bringing meaning to all the things that came before that the Old Testament reveals. So what we have here is something interesting. This day, like no other, John, who records and says that this, these words, the Son of Man must be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up and die. And I think this is kind of remarkable. That's the, in the opening of John's Gospel, third chapter, where most people don't pay attention to that. They talk about John 3.16. That's verses 14 and 15 I just quoted. It was necessary for Christ to be crucified, lifted up, that he could draw all men unto himself. And I carefully say all men because that's the mistake of many people who think, Christ is drawing everybody. Oh, he's drawing everybody, but not all will come and not all will respond. Some, by the way, only respond to, here we go, an invitation. But the true response, let me just say, has never been one that was mandated by a request. Just think of that. If you think long enough, you'll think if you're really reading this Bible, you're not going to find anything except man asking, what must I do to be saved? I've never read anywhere else, anything else but that. Now, we begin to watch the scripture being fulfilled here in these pages in the chapter that I just read to you. Um, and I wrote down a couple of instances of things where it just kind of goes in record. We have that he must be, uh, his death had to be public and visible um, to fulfill the scripture, that he, he would be numbered with the transgressors as Isaiah declared. And something strange in Matthew's record, it says that some sat down and watched him there. That's Matthew 27, 36. Some sat down while he was hanging on the cross. Some sat down and watched him there. And it's not as though crucifixion was rare. Crucifixion was a common punishment, a common death sentence. Some sat down and watched him there, I'm sure, to ridicule. Some maybe wanted to sit down to see what would happen. Who knows why they sat down, maybe curiosity. But the interesting thing is that when it says he had to die and no man would take his life, he lay it down. I've had people argue with me, well, then why was he crucified? Well, I, I'm going to give you the argument that he picked the day. He allowed the timing, if you will, because he could have been killed at another time earlier, but it wasn't the right time. And equally, if it wasn't the right day, he probably could have gotten himself off the cross. He's a miracle worker, right? Could do anything. But the accusation against him is you could save others, but you can't save yourself. In John's record, we have four, four soldiers, each one taking some part of his garment, and the fifth garment they cast, cast lots for. Strange thing, if you think about it, most men that were crucified know and be fighting over their garments. It, there's all these strange things that are recorded in the gospel. I always think, yes, there will be people that will say, how can we trust the gospel records? And I'm telling you something. You really need to listen to Dr. Scott's presentation of the resurre resurrection message. I've often said, if you 
haven't settled that fact of the resurrection, you're never going to be able to stand firmly on this whole counsel of God and say, He is, and therefore I know where I have committed my trust. I know in whom I am faithing, and I'm not mistaken. And just as the Bible says many times over, he who believes, and I'm using that word just as the King James does, but it's actually to faith, will not be ashamed, will not be confounded. And that's not to say in your lifetime either. That's talking about the things that are promised to you and to me, beginning with, not ending, life eternal. Now, mark these points in your mind, anybody who wants to begin to argue this, and you find out if you listen long enough and if you'll study the resurrection, you will find that there's enough evidence in here that at some point you're going to have to come to that conclusion. Now, I was lucky. I came into the church, and I use the word lucky, yes. Came into the church, and I didn't have any, there was no problem when I heard Dr. Scott present the resurrection, to me there was no problem with any of the pieces of information he presented because it seemed my approach was just like Jesus talking to those children, like childlike faith. It seemed self-evident to me. There could be no other way. And we're not talking about someone who's delusional and someone who's just merely following or weak-minded because, believe me, there is no person who's got more questions and more doubts and more things to pull apart because I always think when I hear somebody, especially back in those days, I'd hear people talking about God and religion, I'd say, there's something wrong here. I would find every single thread to pull on. Let's pull this puppy apart, right? Because I don't want to be a part of something that's going to be a sham. But you begin to look at the evidence, and if you do, you better look out. It is going to change your life and the way you look at everything. Now, unfortunately, most people don't look at the evidence, but I'm just citing a few things here that, to me, are kind of interesting. Those people who ridiculed him, again, in Matthew's gospel, they passed by. Not the ones who sat down to watch, but the ones who were passing by. They said, this is the guy who said he would destroy the temple in three days and raise it up again, because they didn't understand what he was saying. And then they say, well, he saved others. He can't save himself. We've got another group of people who are onlookers, just watching the thing. And then, of course, Christ's strange prayer depending on which record you read, but the one that I'm reading is him saying, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, which basically reinforces, no man takes my life, I lay it down of myself. And it says straightway after he prayed this prayer, he gave up the spirit. And the unusual thing is his quick death, how quickly he died. And you've got to think that while he died, these two other thieves are still hanging there, one on each side, malefactors or thieves as they're called, are still hanging there in misery, wrestling until they too will finally give way to the same death. Now just think about that. If you could remove yourself from the familiarity of this story, and if you could remove yourself from some preconceived ideas, and just think about these two men, as I said, there, there are only two types of people. And there are only two types of people. Don't be mistaken about this. There, there, we're not talking about skin color. We're not talking about nationality. We're not talking about gender. There are only two types of people in this world. Settle that, and everything else becomes clear and in focus. There are those people who will say, Christ, indeed, the risen Savior, Savior of the world, His shed blood given for the remission of sins to reconcile sinning man back to the Father to restore us to the thing that God set out in the first place to give Adam and Eve in the garden. Or Jesus Christ, I do not need Him. Jesus Christ, what do I want to know about that? There's only two types. Oh, there'll be people who think they're in the gray area, but they're not. And it's interesting to see, as you begin to have dialogue with people, how even people you may know very closely in your life, how poorly they may understand the simplicity of this message and yet the complexity of it. Because here is, and I've said this many times, repetition for those who have been around a long time, new for some of you who are just coming to listen today or in recent times here, the problem is recognizing our state. Even this last week, 
I had a conversation with a very sweet older gentleman in his mid-80s telling me I'm a good person. He's speaking of himself. I'm a good person. I give to charity. I've never killed anybody. I've never hurt anybody. I'm a good person. And I stopped. And I want to be, you always want to be respectful. That's the one thing I wish this younger generation could understand, talking to older people. You always want to be respectful and respect those elders. But I asked this person, I said, well, what then separates you, who, assuming that this is a Christian, what separates you from the Buddhist who's basically a good person and from the Jew who's basically a good person and from the person who doesn't believe in anything at all, but they're basically a good person. What separates us then? What is it that separates us, that makes us different? And I said, here's the problem. To the Buddhist, they may be a good person, practice good deeds, and I have many Buddhist friends. They believe in reincarnation. They don't believe in the things that we receive through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, life eternal, forgiveness of sins, life eternal. What's the difference between this group of people and that group of people? If everybody's good, then why do we need God? And, you know, somebody was right in pointing out I should have driven the conversation just a little bit further because there's nobody good, as the scripture indicates, but God. This is the problem with most people. And I, I'm praying right now for the Holy Spirit to be opening up the ears of some who don't quite understand this. I have stood... In this, on this platform, doing what I do now, we're looking at 12 years, and I'm thinking to myself, there are still people who don't understand why I have said continually through this period, no, there, it's, there's nothing good in me, just like Paul, there is no good that dwelleth in me. The only thing that makes me good is the righteousness that I've received in Christ. That is a quality that God looks at me for my faith in him. He looks at me as though I'm just like him, but I'm not. And I, just like that publican, cry out, Lord, be merciful to a sinner like me. I don't stand there and say, thank my God, I'm not like so-and-so. And then I know because of what Christ has done, I'm made worthy, I'm made whole, I'm made complete. My Bible tells me if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that means you don't walk around with yesterday's sins and people that say they don't sin. Sorry, friend. We need to sit down and talk about two things that haven't been covered. The state you were born in, which is called Adam, and the things that you do daily, which is called sinning. <laughs> Both are called sinning. And the Bible says all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and fallen short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Jesus Christ. So all fall short of that glory. Put a period there. But so difficult for us to understand, which is why this chapter, I picked this specifically, because it speaks of the necessity to understand Christ our Passover, that this particular thief, the one that said, this man has done nothing amiss, but we are receiving justly for our deeds. Something of his understanding not making an excuse, something of his understanding of why he deserved to be there. And then something of his faith in the statement, Lord, remember me. And I've just jumped ahead of myself because I can pick from any passage here and talk about 1 Corinthians 1.18, talking about the preaching of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness, but to those who are being saved, it's what? What is it? salvation, the power of God. It's precious. It is the truth. It is the revelation that God said there are two types of people. I just said that in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1.18. There are two types of people. There you go. Anywhere you look, by the way, you're going to find two types of people and all have the opportunity. It's not as though you could say, well, the Bible says some are created to destruction, some to honor and some to dishonor, but all have the opportunity. Please indulge me. Saul, King Saul, he was King Saul, just as David was King David. Both men fell short, but one man chose to acknowledge and to listen, for the most part, to God. 
while the other chose to do what was right in his own eyes, including ignore God's spokesman, the prophet that God had given Samuel, and the instructions that God said simply, trust and take my word. Now think about this, two types of people, Sergius Paulus and Gallio, both governors. One man could see and perceive that this is a gospel that brings salvation, the other disinterested. I could go down a list of people in the Bible just like that. So the same thing is true here. We see two men, Christ in the middle. And the interesting thing is this, this man that is hanging there, um, his mother is looking on, some women, another gospel record describes some women, and that his, the care of his mother, he is entrusted to John, the disciple of love. Now, it's very interesting. When Christ finally gives up the last breath, that centurion standing there says, truly this was the son of, son of God. Some may argue about whether or not this man at that moment became a believer or not. I don't care. The one thing that's a reality, somebody uttering, truly this man was the son of God. Enough for me to say this man saw, and it was enough for that man to see, whether it was the darkening of the sky, whether it was the shaking of the ground, or the dead people coming out of the tomb, or whether he came to it, but he still came to the utterance, truly this was the son of God. Now, both, I'm looking at two different Gospels. Luke's Gospel calls these two men um, malefactors. Matthew's Gospel calls them listes, malefactor from kakurgos, kakurgos, kakos ergos, kakos, bad, evil, depraved, ergos, worker or doer, doer of evil. We don't know what the crime was. Uh, Matthew 27, 38 calls them two thieves, the Greek listes, brigand, thief, or robber. And it really doesn't matter how you want to understand these two different words. These are two different words, but they represent two men sentenced to die. Think of it, both on e one on each side of Jesus. And I want you now to look with me at this passage in Luke again, and I want you to look about something so remarkable that this man says, in Luke 23 and 42, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. I, just, I, I wish I could put a period there for a second and, and just think about the fact of this man who, I want you to think about this. He wasn't, I'm going to speculate. It's not in the, in the scriptures, but I'm going to speculate that he was not moving in the crowds that Jesus moved in while Jesus was performing miracles, feeding the multitudes, opening the eyes of the blind, making the lame to walk. I do not believe that that man was present. There were no great spectacles to be seen, just a dying man at his side. If you think about it, if you really think about it, it's just a dying man. He says, Lord, it, this is what's remarkable to me. Just a dying man is by his side. I'm, when I say just a dying man, I'm referring to Christ at this point because the man who says, Lord, remember me, has, he has had no evidence. And by the way, if he were to be able to even look upon Christ, all he would see is this, a man in a death sentence just as he was, and yet he utters this. I think it's staggering. I've read over this many times, and the simplicity of all this, and yet the depth of all this. Lord, no man can call Jesus, Lord, the scripture says, except something move inside. I want you to just indulge me. Indulge me in this for just a second. A similar conversation this week where two people are talking about people who believe versus spin. I'm not even going to try and distinguish between believe and faith right now. Let's just keep it simple. Between people who believe that Jesus is Lord and two individuals going at it. I'm just, I'm like the, I'm just watching a tennis game and I'm watching the ball go back and forth listening. And what I find interesting is that one man doesn't really understand that you can say to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But to believe what? One must believe that he indeed is what his name, Jesus, he shall save his, the people from their sins, that his name actually carries the meaning of what he came to do. One must, one must actually be able to say, I understand this. This is not just the mouth saying, Jesus is Lord. This is what God complained about with the prophet Isaiah. Their lips move, but their heart is far from me. 
And it's quite another thing, I digress back to this, to understand the state you are in when Christ finds you. What I love about this thing is that there is no way that this man could paint himself any differently. You know, when you think about the people that Christ encountered, you can think about how they could have had the opportunity to try and dupe Christ. Zacchaeus could have tried. He could have said, hey, I'm up here in this tree trying to get a glimpse at you because you're a celeb and I know all the stuff that you do. And I, hey, I've, I've been trusting you for these last so many years. He could have tried that. Of course, Christ would have seen through that. But he could have tried it. We could talk about Peter's denial and do the same thing. But Jesus not only predicted and foretold his denial, but restored him. Or we could talk about Saul, who ultimately Paul becomes defender of the faith and persecuted the church to defender of the faith. But this man here, it's pretty hard to dupe somebody when you're nailed to a tree, hanging there and dying and bleeding and, and screaming misery. It's pretty hard to say, hey, they got it all wrong. What do you think about this? This is, it took me a long time to get to this place to understand and this is what I'm really, really praying for, especially for people who have not been taught this. Now, the Catholic Church takes it too far and will never let you get out of the mia culpa, mia culpa, mia maxima culpa on, on the regard that there is no washed and cleansed concept where you can walk out from the old man and begin to rise to walk in newness of life because there's something that keeps you bound. This is why the difference between artwork where you see Christ is still on the cross. He's still bleeding versus crosses that are empty. It's not empty because there's no one else to crucify. It's because he's not there anymore. Same thing about the empty tomb. So when I talk about this coming to a right mindset, it requires that somebody actually begin to have an encounter, as I said many times, with the risen Christ. Do you really think as Paul went down the Damascus Road on the mission to persecute and and take off uh, out of the way these Christian, these Christians that were going out there to preach. Do you really think that in his mind he thought he was a bad man? He thought he was doing God's will by going out and persecuting those who were in the way, and I'm talking about those referred to as Christians, early, the early Christian church referred to as in the way. His goal was to take them out of the way, and he was doing that. He thought he was on a mission from God and that he was doing good. And from his frame of reference, good deeds, good works. Let me ask you now. Let me go back and ask you this question. What did Paul do that merited God coming to him, knocking him down, blinding him, giving a message to go into a prophet's house to receive his sight and then to go on and preach Christianity, no, no longer the zealot for uh, Judaism, to go and preach Christianity. What exactly did Paul do to merit that? And the answer is not a thing. And I ask you the same, what, did the thief, what good works did the thief on the cross do to make it in? The answer is nothing. You know, when people talk about, well, what, what do you do? What type of stuff do you do in your church? You know, when anybody asks you that, I want you to go back to the most simplistic gospel message right here, the thief on the cross. He said, Lord, remember me. And you might say, well, that's pretty audacious if you think about it. He didn't say, Lord, now forgive me, I'm not trying to be blasphemous. But Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I've sinned greatly. I... <laughs> he said, Lord, remember me. It's pretty, if you think about it, it's audacious. Think about the people in this book who cried out, Lord, remember me. Jeremiah 15, 15, the prophets lament, and he says, Lord, remember me and visit me. Nehemiah's prayer, if you remember in chapter 13, Lord, remember me. And Nehemiah adds, and my good deeds that were done for you, for the temple. The psalmist in 106 cries the same thing, remember me and visit me with thy salvation. But to a thief who has not properly repented, my goodness, crucify him. Oh, that's right, he already is, <laughs> right? If you think about it, this is, if, you, if, you're, if you're fortunate enough to get into a church where they're teaching you the Bible, be careful because there'll be people that say, well, if you haven't properly repented, if you haven't gone through the motions, if you haven't done, if you haven't checked these boxes. And I just look at the simplicity of this. He wasn't, 
And I, I, I tell you, I baptize people, but he wasn't even baptized. <gasps> <laughs> Think about this. He just says, Lord, remember me. And I ask, I ask you to really think about something. Many times we look at the conversions recorded in the New Testament and we try to make some similarities, some analysis of how exactly they might compare or not compare to people's experiences. Like you have many times, I've seen this on Christian TV, where people want to interview the guy who has the greatest testimony and they liken it to the Apostle Paul because it's such a radical thing that happened. Now come over here and tell the people what the Lord did for you so that all you can feel like the Lord hasn't done very much for you. <laughs> but he saved you. But, you know, but this guy's got a really good story here. So let's listen to him. Let's all kind of see how much more the Lord has done for this one. But the reality is that if you want to look at conversions, there is more similarity with most of the people, most of the eyeballs looking at me. There's more similarity, including mine, with the thief on the cross than any other person in this book. There wasn't somebody who led me in a special prayer. There wasn't somebody who said, this is that. Now, I didn't say, Lord, remember me. I don't even think I would have the, at early on, I would have the audacity to even say, Lord, remember me. But by baby steps, I came to a reality that without Christ, I would be like those Egyptian children slayed by the death angel. I would be outside the very thing that's promised, and it's a simple thing. Now, here, as I said, no one calls Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit has not essentially been given, but is working in men already, because here he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I won't even take time to uh, check out the Greek on this because there's two different ways of interpreting this, but it doesn't matter. The, the, the more important part is him saying, Lord, remember me. And what I said is eye-catching here is it seems like if there was a comment that Christ could have made after this, although it wasn't the time and it wasn't appropriate. Do you remember when Christ was approached by the centurion? He said, my servant is sick, and he said, only speak the word, and he'll be healed. And Jesus replied, I've not seen such great faith anywhere in Israel. Do you remember that passage? Yes. If there was ever a time for there to be an insert, although inappropriate, it would be right here, because here's a man who doesn't deserve any help, any commendation, anything at all. He says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. If there was an insert, it would be that, I have not seen such great faith because this man knew somehow. And he had a recognition. If you go back and read just the verse before, he says, and we indeed justly were being condemned for this, for we received the due reward of our deeds. Now think about it. Most of the time, and I have, I have worked in prisons and jails, and I've met many folks who, some of them were indeed not guilty. They were falsely accused, but the most part were indeed guilty of a certain crime, but we're talking about a principle now. All are guilty. I just want you to think about that for a second. And I'm talking right now to the people who have difficulty understanding this concept. I do not say there is, like Paul, no good that dwelleth in me because I wish to self-abase myself, but it's fallen nature. And the carnal man or woman and the flesh that says, I can. It's the flesh that says, I will. It's the flesh that says, I can without. It's the spiritual person that says, I can do all things with Christ, and without him I can do nothing. You think about all these very simple principles, but hard for that one who's just coming to the reality. As I said to this elderly man, he says, but I've never killed anybody. I've never hurt anybody. And I said, ba -ba 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 -ba. hold that thought. I said, have you ever been really angry with somebody? And he said, well, I wouldn't say really angry, but a little bit. And I said, okay, a little angry. Now we have split hairs now, a little angry. And listen, for an elderly person, you cut them some slack. A little angry, okay. Well, Jesus took that law, thou shall not kill, and he raised the bar and he said, you've heard it say unto you, thou shall not kill, but behold, I say to you, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murderer, you're as guilty as committing the deed of murder. 
So don't try and split hairs and somehow try and paint yourself a little bit better or you try, to, try to whitewash what's there. I've told you, I'm no Mother Teresa. I've had my share and continue. I mean, I told you this. Just all you got to do is drive here, especially in holiday time. You're going to need a lot of repenting, folks. You know, that parking space you were eyeing for 20 minutes that, you know, you just didn't wedge in close enough and some guy in a smaller car turns in and waves at you too and says thank you because he thinks that you were, you were letting him yield to get into that spot and he can walk away and then you drive away, mm -hmm, right? Uh, you can't go there. You can't say, well, I've never done that. This same, very same individual said, well, I've never robbed anybody and I, boy, oh boy, don't, you know, you shouldn't have a conversation with the preacher. Because I said, well, have you ever given to God? Leave that one alone. Because you know what the answer is there. Malachi covers that one. You know what the answer is. Leave the, you, you, I've killed this one to death, so you understand what I'm saying. But the reality is that this man says, this man has done nothing wrong, but we receive the due, the, the due reward of our deeds. Now think about if we were to receive the due reward of our deeds. And I really want, want just, just take, it, you don't even need to take seconds. It'll, it'll flood your mind if you're really thinking about it. And we're not talking, about, it doesn't have to be large things. It can be the smaller things. As I said, a miss is as good as a mile. And I digress back to saying what Paul said in Romans 3.23, all have fallen short. There is no wiggle room for this. And saying I'm basically a good person is, is putting on display your knowledge of how much you don't know about your true self and your standing before God. When the right mindset comes and the right understanding of God and you look unto him who is the architect, the author of our faith, trusting him for your salvation, he looks, as my late husband used to say, he puts on the spectacles looking at you as though you are just like him, as though you are perfect. He sees you like that as long as you remain in the faith, faithing unto him, to his finished work. So think about this. Now listen to Jesus' response. The King James, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, to thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now if you read the Greek, the Greek word is not verily, but the Greek word amen. Amen. Using a, a Hebrew Hebrewism, amen, 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 so be it, the promise or certainty when Jesus says something, and today, and I just, I, again, I'm, gonna, I'm going to make a false punctuation for a minute, and I'm going to say verily, it's not, don't even add it, I'm just trying to do this for the sake of giving you some perspective. Instead of verily I say unto thee, I wish it would read amen, period, as this man said Jesus to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I wish it would say amen, period. And it doesn't, and I don't want you to change it, but I, what I want you to get is that and today. Now, the great debate of what happened when Jesus gave up the ghost, and we know we read elsewhere in the scripture that says he went and he preached to departed spirits. And we know that on the third day when he rose, he appeared first, Unto Mary Magdalene, for she was there weeping, and one record she's weeping, and she thinks he's the gardener, and asks where, she, where did they put the Lord's body. Uh, but all have this three days later, which is why Christ said there'll be no other sign but the sign of Jonah, pointing to his resurrection when they asked him for a sign. But today, not tomorrow. Some have really wrestled with this because it says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You'll be with me in heaven today. And the great debate, he went to preach to departed souls and went to preach to those that were damned, you know, all the, the different passages we read. But today is today. And although he died earlier, he died sooner than this man, Today is today, and I said to you, it's very ironic and very beautiful and very fitting as a picture of grace that the last companion and the last conversation that he has is this dying thief beside him who looks to him with no special prayer, with no baptism, with no special anything, and just, as I said, only but by the Spirit, Lord, remember me. And Jesus replied, Amen 
and today, and today means today, and I said the last companion, the last earthly companion, and the first one, undoubtedly, he entered into heaven with. Now, don't go and get into the argument of, of him telling Mary, don't touch me, I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Just take it exactly at face value, today is today. And I've often quoted the passage out of Hebrews, today, if you'll harden not your hearts, hearken, listen to what the Spirit is saying even to you, for what you might think in your mind, you are the chiefest of sinners or you rank among the worst, come to a reality of your standing before God. You talk to him about it. Now, we don't have a record here of this one doing anything except, Lord, remember me, but I can give you the template out of David's pen in Psalm 51, which is a beautiful one to read, which says, Against thee, Lord, and against thee only have I sinned. And that was after he went in unto Bathsheba and committed the unpardonable sin with her and the slaying of her husband, simply to seize her and take her as his own. Equally, Psalm 25, which is a great description of asking God to remember, to visit us, to, to draw near. And I think the real important thing that I'm hoping will take root here is exactly somewhere else in the Bible, Psalm 103. For once we come to trust God, it says, Our sins are, He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. He's removed our iniquities. And that's what you walk out from under. You no longer are walking around saying misery, doom, and despair. But you walk out knowing what he has done. Don't forget all of his benefits. The one who heals all your diseases. The one who is abundant and plentiful in mercy. Who sees and who knows, by the way. I don't care if you want to paint yourself as... Somebody said, well, what about the Pope? And I said, what about the Pope? <laughs> don't get me started on that. And I say this publicly. I have no quarter. I'm not ashamed to say this publicly as one of those press releases about two, three weeks ago, and they say the Pope has now given license for the priest to forgive women who have had abortions. And I said, baloney, no man, no woman, nobody can forgive anybody on earth. You can forgive as in what we're told to do for the relation between man and man, human and human, but no one on earth has the power to forgive sins except Jesus Christ. The Bible declares it. That's what I stand on. That's why when we read the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, it says he was wounded. He was bruised and wounded for our transgressions, all of our diseases. The Lord laid it all upon him, and we walk out from underneath all of that. Paul in the New Testament says, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, but we, for his taking our place, walk out from underneath that, and no man on earth, I don't care what type of hat or what type of costume you wear, what type of type of clerical thing you think you have. There is no one on earth that has the power to do that except the power that comes from Jesus Christ alone and faith in him alone brings you to that point of being washed, cleansed, and forgiven. And just like this man, the worst of the worst hanging there, not hanging there for good behavior. Today, amen, today, this day, you'll be with me in paradise, it'll be in heaven. Now, I... I just... I want you to know... I said this is basic Christianity, but I have to constantly war with this with people who are either coming into the church and are so well taught that they've got guilt laid upon them, upon guilt, upon guilt, or they'll gravitate back to these... And they are. They're damnable traditions that make void the word of God I know one thing, and I have lived by this. I've told you I'm not perfect, but when I read a passage like this, I recognize a few things. The nearness of things eternal. I've told you the breath of eternity is on every single believer. We don't look at the things regarding the, t the, the temporal and tremble. Because we understand we, we are learning eternal principles. If Jesus did not raise up from the dead, then our faith is in vain. And friends, go do whatever you got to do and enjoy it while you can. But there's too much proof in this book. There's too much evidence 
There's too many prophecies in the Old Testament. There are too many different uh, mouths speaking and declaring in this New Testament and attesting to the verity of his resurrection and his resurrection power that I should stand here and tell you anything else except the breath of eternity be on those who are looking unto him. And there's only one thing that he requires, just one thing. Through and through, each time somebody is healed, he says, Thy faith hath made thee whole. And your faith will make you not only whole here on earth, but your faith will make you whole as you stand before him in his presence. I get really, really tired of having to tell people. And forgive me, that's just the most honest thing that I can say. If you are not willing to acknowledge God's divine sovereignty in your life and understand he has the power, he possesses the power. A woman who has had an abortion or a person who has committed adultery, I'm not saying any of these things, or I put my stamp of approval on each of these things, but let me just tell you, the problem with all of these people is they, are, they choose which people they will throw stones at and which people they will pardon. And to me, that's hypocrisy. If one has sinned, this way, then I can categorize another 20 or 30 because it's in the nature, it's in the fabric of our DNA to be fallen. Don't go and try and point out a single group and say, well, these are guilty of immoral and sexual behavior, or these are guilty of this, or these are guilty of that, because the finger, my friend, will come to be pointed at you and pointed at me, and then no one can stand, and that's why I said you come back to the same place. What must I do to be saved? Bible. King James Version says, believe, faith, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to go out and do something. You don't need to go down on your knees and beg. You don't need to climb a ladder to try and find heaven. You simply faith. And how is this simple act going to take me into heaven? Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God, which means somebody's got to be opening up this word and putting it out there every single day as we do. There are 168 hours in the week, multiple feeds of gospel messages going out to the world to bring more faith, to bring you to even greater and ever-increasing faith that you might have life and life more abundantly and eternal life on top of all of that, which is the promise. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If there's any person here who can take comfort from this message, as I said, I look at this and I think, I'm just like this one here. You know, the other thief, he said, hey, if he's really, if he's really who he says he is, he can, he can save us too. He can save himself and save us too. And then he watches him die. Now I'm filling in the blanks because that's not there. I'm filling in the blanks. Then he watches him die and he probably said to the other guy, you see you dummy, right? <laughs> now, not everybody will take this message and see the great grace, the last act on earth, and the first act recorded in advance for this man on earth to be today in heaven with Christ. Um, one of the great old-time hymns really tells this story quite adequately. It's a song that our band sings. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile is he, wash all my sins away. Now, if you think about that in the last portion of this, but uh, William, I've said Cowper, it's probably rightly pronounced Cooper, encapsulated this quite properly. And he says, Ere since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Well, I will stand here and keep preaching the wonderful blessedness for every person who understands they are truly just like that one hanging there saying we, we, are, we are reaping our just what we deserve. This man did nothing amiss. Lord, remember me. Today, I pray that this message will settle in for some of you that the Lord is looking upon you in your heart, knows where you've been, knows all your shortfallings, and is still doing the same thing. And today, 
is not today for you in the present, but today will be today in the future someday for your simple faith. And that's all it is, is faith that takes you all the way home. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.